Welcome to Instant Grace, a special installment of Grace Archie with Jim Babka. I'm Jim Babka. Brought to you by the Zero Aggression Project, zeroaggressionproject.org. And today I want to say conspiracy theorizing increases when trust diminishes. Say that again, conspiracy theorizing increases when trust diminishes. Now, will there be conspiracy theorists in high trust environments? Yes, but nowhere near as many. Conspiracy theorizing can be reduced by prioritizing trust. Think about the word con piracy. It's almost like there's two words in there, cons engaged in piracy. And perhaps the con artists engaged in piracy need to come clean and seek redemption in some cases. But do the conspirators ever do that? No, they scold, they gaslight, they shame, they censor. And I'm seeing this behavior from some surprising places. I'm a libertarian. I will vote for the libertarian nominee. And sadly, I'm seeing libertarians attempt to shame people for mistrusting the state. And one of the leading figures in this libertarian quality control movement engaged in pattern recognition himself. As far back as a year ago, he was saying that an outsider conspiracy was underway with the goal of destroying the Libertarian Party. Now, I'm not debating his claim. I'm just pointing out the irony. Trust, by the way, is the precursor to empathy. Thanks to bioeconomist Paul Zak, we now know the hormonal pathway that connects trust to empathy. In other words, increase trust and you increase cooperation and social harmony. But the conspirators can count on a choir of people who believe themselves to be better. And it's more fun to mock and deride, which creates the opposite effect of what they claim to intend. What they claim to intend and what they do are not the same thing pragmatically. And I mean that the science is clear. Thus, it is reasonable to assume that they intend to divide. Division is their point, their real intention. Now, there are conspiracy theories. Our so-called government has done terrible things. The church committee showed us that the 1960s were riddled with covert criminal acts by state actors in their official capacity. Here on this show, and in much of my previous work, I've shown you wars started based on lies, even false flags. There were no nuclear weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. It's just one example of those prevarications. And just over a decade ago, the national leader of intelligence perjured, yes, perjured himself in front of a Senate committee lying in response to a direct question about the prevalence of surveillance. A man named Snowden sacrificed his citizenship to share the truth with you. Now, these events are well understood. They no longer gore anyone's political ox. They've moved from fringe conspiracy theory to well-respected history. Does that mean our leaders and their sycophants are suddenly more honest? Well, in 2021, we were oh so young. You weren't allowed to say that a laboratory was the place where a worldwide sickness began. Even as recently as March 2023, when we did episode number 41 and introduced the actual conspiracy theorizings of the spillover gang, most people were hesitant to admit that the conspiracy theory was likely true. And now the evidence is overwhelming on that side of the ledger, but the hostility to this conspiracy is still so prevalent. And Al Gore's rhythm is still in operation on the biggest platforms where we broadcast this show. So that I had to avoid using certain words just now as I described it to you. And so what? The past is the past, except recognizing the truth of what's actually happening in the moment might save expense or heartache, if not lives. And we have the Cassandra metaphor for a reason. To speak up, to dare to predict the future is to expose ourselves to ridicule, if not contempt, and sometimes, unfortunately, even violence. The opposition seems so confirming. Friends, the propaganda parade always marches right through the center of town, and it has adoring crowds who cheer and even jeer. When the parade is over, the crowd disperses. They don't want to talk about their role anymore. Heck, many of them convince themselves that they knew the truth all along, or at least that's how they parade themselves in front of others. Still, too much conspiracy theorizing falls prey to mere pattern recognition, and it would be irresponsible if you or I repeated it. So if you and I are going to declare the future, we must do so with great caution, using tremendous research of the present circumstance, awesome historical wisdom, and great spiritual circumspection. Because one wrong covers over many rights, diminishing credibility, which in turn reduces your effectiveness with the few ears that are open enough to hear. 
Because of this, we did a three-part series of this Gray Sarkey podcast specifically about conspiracies. I'll put all of these in the show notes, but you should go watch the first episode, number 74, where we explain the, where the term conspiracy theory came from, the power of conspiracy fantasies, and Edward Snowden's taxonomy of conspiracy. In the second episode, number 75, we explain why conspiracy theories occur and five common ways conspiracy theorists get things wrong. Then in the final installment, number 76, we dealt with the myth that big conspiracies can't stay secret because, quote, someone would have talked. Oh, and a bonus. I explained how the Trump shooter was empowered by the ultimate conspiracy theorists, the still to this day people who profess faith, despite so much evidence to the contrary, that one man shot John Kennedy twice and killed him from the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository. That was episode 105. You see, I think it's ungraceful and does no good to simply write off a conspiracy. I may not be able to keep up with all of them, and I might discern that many, maybe even most, are wrong. But even in those instances, I wonder why is something broken? Even the weird myths indicate something social is ajar. Now, I lack time. You do too. We can't find sufficient time to gather all the facts about all the things. In those instances, the graceful thing is to avoid commentary, unless directly asked, and even then, to offer it with humility. But if we choose to speak out, then, from a grace perspective, only two possible responses are left. We must either acknowledge the brokenness of the system that's implicated, or see the hurt in the heart of the person who expresses it.